Welcome to session nine of the Elijah Challenge Training 2.0. Uh, if you cannot hear me, please let me know. If you would like to have this PowerPoint presentation and also the accompanying playlist of videos posted on YouTube, email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Elijah003. Now, let us continue with session nine. Our very final session. First of all, I'd like to share with you some reports from westernized nations. Uh, last at our last session, I shared some reports from India, where we have trained harvest workers, healing the sick, preaching the gospel. Now, what you learn in this training can also be applied in westernized nations, for example, like uh, North America and so forth. And basically what we do is we apply what Jesus commanded in Luke 10, verse 9, which is heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. As an example, let's say you're a member of a church and your pastor allows you to do the training for the members of the church. And so typically what I do is I begin on Friday evening, session one, and then all day Saturday. And then on Sunday morning, we have the application. What we do is we invite those who do not know Jesus and who need healing to come to the Sunday morning service. And there I will preach the gospel to our many guests, many of them who do not know Jesus. And then after that, we heal the sick as evidence that the gospel, which I just proclaimed, is the absolute truth. And so I invite people who need healing to come to the front. And then I instruct the newly trained disciples, which I train just Friday evening, all day Saturday. I invite them to come forward, to stand in a single line facing the people. And then those who need healing, they come to the front. And then the newly trained disciples lay hands on them one on one. And then from the front, I lead them in exercising authority and issuing commands to demons and diseases to go. And after that, people are healed. And then they come to the front and they testify. This uh, one woman you see on the right, her ear was deaf. And as one of the newly trained disciples ministered to her, she could hear. And she is testifying. And that's my wife, Lucille, at the left. And after that, I say, okay, who wants to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? You have not only heard the truth, but you have seen the evidence of the truth. You have seen the miracles which prove that the gospel of the kingdom of God is actually near. And so this is something that you can do. Uh, please just give me a moment here. Okay. I just want to check something. Okay. Now, excuse me for that. Now, Here's something you can do outdoors. This is something that we did in Houston. We, we found a park called the Sherwood Elementary School Park. And on a Saturday morning, we went there and we handed out flyers to the people who lived in that area. We invited them to come Saturday afternoon to, to the park. And there in the park, we would have food, we would have music, and we have games for the children. And so, and we would also tell them that the sick would be healed. And so people would gather and then I would proclaim the kingdom of God to the people. After that, I invited the sick to come forward to be healed by trained disciples. You see that man on the left, standing in the middle, that man was a cocaine addict. He came forward wanting to be set free. He wanted to repent. And so, brothers laid hands on him and as they did so they also rebuked the spirit of addiction and at that moment that man standing in the middle he felt something physical come out of his mouth and leave him well it was nothing physical it was a spirit of cocaine addiction after that he came forward and he testified that the desire and the craving 
for the cocaine had totally left him. He accepted Jesus. Uh, there were other testimonies as well of miraculous healings. And after all the testimonies, then I invited people to come to the front to repent of their sin and believe on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And on the right, you see the people coming forward to believe in Jesus. This is something you can do in a westernized nation. Also, you can go into a prison. And there, you can minister to what I call a captive audience. Uh, the inmates have no choice, but they come to your meeting. And there, you proclaim the kingdom of God, and you heal the sick. Uh, many of the inmates need physical healing. And because they are, yes, because they need God's grace so much, God's grace becomes evident, and many of the inmates are miraculously healed. In this one particular case, after this service where the gospel was preached and many of the inmates were healed, that evening back in their cells, they were praising and worshiping God. Many of them had been healed and had come back to Jesus. This is something you can do in a westernized nation. Uh, back in the year 2010, we were in Brazil. Brazil is, I believe, the fifth largest country in the world in terms of population, fifth or sixth. And we gathered together over 600 disciples. And there we trained them over a period of several days. Uh, we would train them in the mornings. And then in the afternoons, we would send them out door to door into the streets, preaching the gospel and healing the sick. And so they would go from house to house uh, asking, do you have any sick people here? And of course, in a place like Juazeiro do Norte, that was the name of the city where we did this training. Uh, Juazeiro do Norte happens to be the second most idolatrous city in the entire nation of Brazil. And so in a city like that, you will find many sick people and many of them are in the homes. And so our disciples would be invited in to heal the sick. They would heal the sick. Many miracles took place. In fact, 1,920 miracles took place during five days. And then after the miracles, they would proclaim the kingdom of God to their family. And as a result, 1,440 people accepted Christ. That was an historic event in this community. Something like this can be done in a westernized country. We proclaimed the kingdom of God. We taught the Elijah challenge in, in Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, in the UK. Okay. And after this training, which took place in Great Britain, in the UK, there was a leader named Peter Papp. He decided to take what he had trained and use it to reach the lost and proclaim the kingdom of God at New Age festivals. Okay. We find these popping up here and there in westernized countries. And I have entitled this report, Prophets of Baal, Totally Outdone by Trained Disciples in Post-Christian England. Let me read to you Peter's report. The healing weekend took place from Thursday to Sunday, and I led a small healing team. It is a very dark-spirited occult showcase held in the countryside in the Bristol area in England, organized and run by world-famous spiritualist mediums witches, hypnotherapists, fortune tellers, Reiki healers, and so on. It was quite amazing that we were there. It was an awesome and humbling time. Our pitch was great, and the stall holders opposite were warm and friendly. They were just selling clothes and jewelry, so we didn't get distracted or affected by dodgy spirits, dodgy unclean spirits. The rest of the event was packed with a great spectrum of occult and new age practices. Spiritualist mediums competing with each other, tarot card and crystal readers, past life therapists, Reiki healers, fortune tellers, psychic mediums, etc. So you see, this was a very dark event. But it was amazing to see how their effectiveness was greatly limited. One of the most famous such mediums told me that he had only seven visitors on the busiest day when he actually expected crowds, when we had over 50 healings at the same time and several people received Jesus. In 82, infirm people were instantly healed. 
we ministered to a total of 125 people. This is what took place in the UK, in a westernized country. The stall holders opposite us, who had witnessed all that, went on over the three days, all that, excuse me, all that went on over the three days were telling people, quote, those people truly love people. They were talking about us. The love of God is the one thing the powers of darkness cannot counterfeit. I believe that was our biggest testimony and the reason why even so many of the healers and at that event team sent people to us. They sent people to us where they came back again because they felt the love of God amongst us. Even the healers sent people to these believers who had been trained. The event organizers even said to people that if they really want to get healed, they needed to come to see us, meaning the believers, the followers of Jesus Christ. Here's something that uh, we did in Las Vegas. Las Vegas, of course, in America is known as Sin City, Sin City. On a weekend, we were there and in a hotel, we trained a group of disciples with the Elijah Challenge. Friday night, all day Saturday, and then on Sunday morning, I sent them out. Not to go to church, but to go out to the strip to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God. I had each team make a sign. You see the sign there that this couple are holding? Free miraculous healing. Notice the sign says nothing about prayer or God or Jesus. Nothing about religion. It just says free miraculous healing. It's very neutral. So it draws all kinds of people, even atheists and agnostics. If you want to read the report, uh, get a hold of this PowerPoint presentation and click on that link that you see at the left. There is a uh, complete report on our website. But let me share with you what one of the sisters on the team, her, sister, her name was Jan. She's from the state of Wisconsin. Let me share with you what she sent us after that weekend. She said, I totally agree. The hour on the street was like being caught up in Elijah's whirlwind. That was the whirlwind that took him to heaven. For me, it was an, it was an easy way to minister to people on the street for several reasons. First, I was in a small group of five people, so I was not alone. Second, our group was of mixed ages and ethnicity. It seemed ideal as we ministered to Asians, to Blacks, to Hispanics, and to white folks. The diversity of our group seemed to put people we met on the street at ease. We boldly walked the street, smiling and making eye contact, while one of us in the group carried a sign saying, Free Miraculous Healing. As people read it, they understood when we asked if they needed healing in any part of their body. You see, they did not proclaim the gospel first, but they simply asked, do you need healing in any part of your body? They were simply obeying Luke 10, verse 9, where Jesus commanded his disciples to heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now, some of the people said no, but many said yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> After the Friday and Saturday training, each person in our group was willing to take the quote-unquote challenge and minister healing in the name of Jesus. You see, through this training, you get really bold and confident, and you are willing to go out to heal the sick and preach the gospel. I believe the experience exceeded the expectations of our group. Usually, one person would speak first, and the others in our group would agree, meaning one person would lead them in ministering to the sick person in issuing commands. Sometimes the leader would drop back, and another would take a turn leading the healing ministry. After they were miraculously healed, it was a natural transition to ask people if they knew Jesus as Savior, only after they were healed. You see how that makes sense? After the miracle takes place, then the person is very open to hear about Jesus. One man answered he did not know for sure, 
So I asked if he would like to pray the prayer of salvation. He said, yes. So I was able to pray with this young man who was a street dancer and part-time stripper to receive Christ. There he is, that young man, not wearing a shirt. He was outdoors performing. I don't know what he was performing, but he was healed of his infirmities. And then he accepted Jesus right there on the Las Vegas Strip. So something like this can be done in westernized countries. After the Elijah Challenge training in Las Vegas, I realized how easy it is to just ask people if they have any illness and if they would like ministry for healing. So easy. This was easier than door-to-door -door evangelism. So many people have pain, and many will take the offer to receive ministry if we ask them, because it's free. They have nothing to lose. So it makes sense why Jesus commanded his disciples to heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. We did not concern ourselves with those who rejected us. People rejected Jesus all the time. We just moved on to the next people coming our way. I would do this again, and I would recommend this training to every believer. Thank you, founders of the Elijah Challenge, for surrendering yourselves to God and offering this training. It was so good to meet all of you taking the challenge. We are bolder than before. We have no fear in the Lord. Finally, I'd like to share with you what we did in our city of Houston. We have a Chinatown, and in Chinatown, we have something called the Hong Kong Food Market. It's actually a shopping mall consisting of entirely Asian stores and a big supermarket. Well, we went there. This took place about 20 years ago, okay? And we made this huge sign in three languages, Vietnamese, English, and Chinese a big sign now of course no longer if i did this again i would not use the word prayer because prayer is religious and we're not preaching religion and we don't just want to draw religious people so now we would say free miraculous healing instead of healing prayer okay that's just an update but we did this every saturday over a period of months and let me tell you between 80 and 90 percent of the infirm people to whom we ministered at this mall were miraculously healed, after which we shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, when you minister to the sick in a church, you usually don't see so many people healed. But when you take the gospel outside of the church building, when you take it to a public place where you dare to do that, that's where you really see powerful miracles taking place. That's where you see many people miraculously healed because that is the whole point of the supernatural authority and power which Jesus gave to his disciples. It was for proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard. So let's stop using this only to minister to sick believers in churches, but let's take it out to the public places of the world. Of course, we need to wait until the pandemic is over, but now the Lord is getting you ready. Of course, we have quite a few people who have been healed of COVID-19. I'm not going to take the time to read them, but let me tell you, the Lord has given us supernatural authority and power to heal all diseases, including COVID-19. Now, let me say something about ministering to addicts, drug addicts. Drug addicts can quickly be delivered from the craving for the drug by the use of authority and mountain moving faith, as well as power. Let me tell you why. Drug addiction is a combination of two factors. One is demonic and the other is physical. Okay, there is a unclean spirit of drug addiction. And also, uh, there is a physiological addiction, addiction of the body for the drug. So drug addiction has two components. And it happens that Jesus has given us authority over both areas, over both the demonic as well as the physical. And so we can use the Lord's supernatural authority and power to minister to drug addicts. And if they want to be set free, 
they can instantly be set free. Just like that man I shared who was the cocaine addict at our open air event in Houston, he wanted to be set free. And when the men ministered to him, he felt the spirit of cocaine addiction come out of his mouth and leave him, and he was set free from the craving. So you can minister to drug addicts very, very quickly through the use of supernatural authority and power. It does not take months and months and months. No, it can be immediate. Even people addicted to smoking can be set free. However, they must accept Christ after they are set free. That is very important. If they do not, the demon will return, according to Luke 11, verses 24 and 26, and maybe the condition will be worse, even seven times worse. So this is very important. If you're going to minister to a drug addict, you tell them in advance, if you are set free, you must accept Jesus. Otherwise, your condition, your addiction will become worse than before. Now, Let's have a look at the gift of healing, the gift of healing now, okay? Gift of healing. Um, just a moment, okay? Gift of healing. The operation of the gift of healing is different from the exercise of authority and power. It is different. We have already examined this in the past. Let's go over it once more. Okay, there are four essential differences between the gift of healing and authority and power. Number one, the authority came before the gift. The gift of healing was not available until the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. However, authority and power were already given to the disciples in the Gospels. So power and authority came before the gift. Second difference, according to 1 Corinthians 12, the gift... The gifts, especially the gift of healing, is primarily for ministering healing to sick, born-again believers. Whereas, supernatural authority and power are primarily for actually healing the sick in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God to those who never heard, meaning evangelism. So the gift of healing is primarily for within the church, within gathering of believers. Whereas, authority and power are primarily for outside the church difference number three every disciple has a measure of the supernatural authority and power to heal whereas not everyone has the gift of healing no not everyone difference number four the operation of the gift differs from the operation of authority and power let's look at the differences in operation in contrast to authority and power, operating in the gift of healing may require very little effort. Very little effort. Let's look at a likely manifestation of the gift of healing as recorded in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, it is actually never explicitly stated that a particular miraculous healing took place as a result of the operation of the gift of healing. It is never explicitly stated that a miracle took place because of the gift of healing. Of course, it does exist. I believe there are manifestations of the gift of healing in the book of Acts, but it is never explicitly stated so. Let's look at a particular instance where I believe the gift of healing was in operation. Acts 5, verse 12. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. Now, who were these people among whom the apostles performed many miracles? Well, let's see. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. So, here we have meetings where the apostles were performing miracles among the believers in gatherings of believers. No one else dared join them, meaning the believers, even though they were highly regarded by the people. So we conclude the following. Here the apostles were ministering to the believers in what today we would call church services. 
And so these were not primarily evangelistic events. These were gatherings of born-again believers. Verse 14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number, meaning to the number of born-again believers. People were accepting Jesus. Yes, I believe that as these miracles took place among the believers, yes, more and more people were accepting Jesus. Verse 15, as a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. It is likely that Acts here is describing gatherings of believers, or what we would call church services, where a gift of healing given to Peter is in operation. I believe here, gift of healing is in operation. Notice that Peter is not exercising authority by issuing commands. No, he's not laying hands on any sick people. No, he's just walking along. And as his shadow touches people, God heals them directly. And so for me, of course, this is not authority or power. Therefore, for me, it must be in a manifestation of the gift of healing, gift of miracles. Verse 16, crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Now, notice that scripture does not specifically say here that people accepted Christ because of the miracles. It does not say that. As it does in the three other accounts we have already examined from the book of Acts, where Peter performed miracles. Let's just do a brief review. In our earlier examinations of the three healings or miracles performed by God through Peter, it was specifically mentioned that afterwards people believed on the Lord. You recall, after Peter healed the lame beggar in Acts chapter 3, a crowd of amazed onlookers gathered together and P Peter preached the gospel to them and many of them accepted Christ. Okay, so here many people accepted Christ after the miracle and the preaching of the gospel. Number two, you recall after Peter healed Aeneas in Acts chapter 9, what happened? Well, people believed in Jesus. And number three, after Peter raised Dorcas back to life, in Acts chapter 9, what happened? Many people believed in Jesus. So in these three miracles, after the miracle took place, people believed in Jesus. So therefore, all three of these events were evangelistic in nature, resulting in souls coming to Christ. But here in Acts chapter 5, where Peter's shadow is in operation, there is no such mention of people turning to Jesus after the miracles. Therefore, perhaps in Acts chapter 5, those who gathered were mostly already believers or new believers who needed healing or deliverance. Okay, that is my conclusion. That is why Peter was likely operating in the gift of healing at those meetings and not using authority and power to heal the sick, as he did on other occasions, when after the miracle, he would be preaching the gospel to people who did not know Jesus. So again, I believe here in Acts chapter 5, we see the manifestation of the gift of healing or the gift of miracles through Peter. But on other occasions in the book of Acts, on the other occasions, it's almost exclusively the exercise of authority and power resulting in a miracle. Now, there are different manifestations or forms of the gift of healing. Not simply Peter's shadow, but there are different manifestations. Uh, actually, in the Greek, it actually says gifts of healings in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Not gift of healing, but gifts of healings. So there are different manifestations or forms of the gift of healing. Now, here are some other examples of the gift of healing 
uh, in my opinion. Uh, God heals an infirm person after prayer to God alone in its various forms. Uh, one brother came up to me and told me that after he prays in tongues, people get healed. Okay, to me, that is a gift of healing. Uh, it's a priestly action when he prays in tongues. It's like prayer, except it's in, in an unknown tongue and God heals. Uh, to me, uh, that is a manifestation of the gift of healing. He doesn't use authority. He doesn't use power, but gift of tongues, but prayer in tongues and God heals. So to me, I would classify that as a manifestation of the gift of healing. Or God heals an infirm person as someone worships the Lord or leads worship. Perhaps in your church, you have experienced the following during Sunday morning. As the worship leader leads worship, God begins to heal people who are sick in the congregation. Now, to me, that is a gift. No one is rebuking demons or diseases. No one is laying hands on the sick. Everyone is simply worshiping God. And God is pleased when he receives that worship and he begins to heal people directly. And so to me, that is a manifestation of the gift of healing. Or God heals following a prophetic word by a believer. There may be a believer was a gift of prophecy and he issues a prophetic word to someone who is sick and after that prophetic word that sick believer is miraculously healed to me that is a gift in these three instances involving priestly or prophetic actions no one is exercising authority by issuing commands so for me uh, these are manifestations of the gifts of healings in general, the gift of healing can be in operation as God heals in response to actions like prayer or praise directed to him by disciples or through prophetic words or actions toward other believers. In, in contrast to the gift of healing, authority to heal is in operation when a disciple issues a command to an infirmity or infirm person with mountain moving faith. So you see how the exercise of authority differs from the gift of healing. Power is in operation when hands are laid on the sick. So scripture is very precise when it defines the use of authority and the use of power. Gift of healing is different now let's go on to ministering healing to infirm believers from james chapter 5 verse 14 through 18. up until now as you well know the context of this training has been outside the church sharing the gospel with those who do not know jesus and in that context you use authority and power to heal the sick as evidence to those who do not know Jesus that our God is the one true God and that Jesus is the only way to him. All right. So now we are going to switch gears and we are going to study how to minister healing to sick believers in the context of body of Christ, not in the evangelistic context. Now, let me ask you a question here. <clears throat> Why does it seem that the instructions in James chapter 5 for ministering to sick believers don't really work? I'm sure that you have seen a pastor or an elder minister to the sick according to James chapter 5, and there's no instant miracle. Let's try to answer this question. So now we turn to ministering healing, not in the evangelistic context, but for most of us in the more familiar context of building up the body of Christ during meetings of believers by ministering to sick believers. So ministering healing to sick believers is generally based on teaching from James 5, verses 14 through 18. So that's where we're going to go. Who was the author of this epistle? Well, of course, his name was James. And scholars tell us that it was most likely James, the younger brother of Jesus. 
So according to scholars, the one who wrote the epistle called James was actually the younger brother of Jesus, most likely. If James was in fact the younger brother of Jesus, then we can reasonably assume that James learned about healing directly through the ministry of his older brother, Jesus. I believe we can assume that. His younger brother would follow his older brother around, watching him and observing him, and he saw Jesus healing the sick, casting out demons with authority. So I believe we can very reasonably assume that James, whatever James taught in this epistle, was based on what he learned directly from Jesus. Uh, excuse me. Now, whoever was the author of this epistle, if it was not James, the younger brother of Jesus, whoever it was, he wrote it to encourage believers to continue in the teaching handed down by Jesus Christ. So even if the author of this epistle was not the younger brother of Jesus, to me, it doesn't matter. Whoever it was, he wrote the epistle to encourage believers to continue in the teaching that Jesus taught. So, in order to understand what James taught, we need to understand what Jesus taught about healing. And, of course, we have been studying that in great detail. How did Jesus teach his disciples to minister to the sick? Well, we have seen that he never taught them to pray to God for the sick and then leave the results up to him. Never, never, never did Jesus teach his disciples to pray for the sick the way we do traditionally. Never. Rather, he taught them to heal the sick by exercising the supernatural authority he had given them over diseases and by laying hands over the sick with power. That is what Jesus taught his disciples. Again, he never taught his disciples to do traditional healing prayer as we do today. Never. But instead, he taught them the use of supernatural authority over diseases. He taught them to lay hands over the sick with power. So let's do some review here. Before we go on, Luke 9, verse 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So we see in the Gospels, he didn't send them out to pray for the sick. No, he sent them out to heal the sick by using the supernatural power and authority he had given them. And of course, in Luke 10, verse 9, we see Jesus commanding his disciples, heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So it is absolutely clear in the Gospels, Jesus did not teach his disciples to pray for the sick the way we do. He never commanded his disciples to pray for the sick the way we do today. Never. That's what Jesus taught his disciples. And from whom did James learn about healing? James learned about healing from his older brother, Jesus. Now, in light of Luke 9 and Luke 10, which we just studied, let's now look at what James taught in chapter 5 about ministering healing to sick believers. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Now, James here is talking to believers. Is there any believer among you who is sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. The elders who have authority in the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Notice that James did not teach praying for the sick believer, but James taught praying over the sick believer, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, very sadly, in other translations of the Bible, for example, in the Chinese translation or the Indonesian translation, uh, many other translations of the Bible in other languages do not say pray over. They just say pray for. That's all. Uh, they do not differentiate between praying over and praying for. But 
praise God, in the English translation, there is a differentiation between praying over and praying for. And we want to look at that very significant difference between praying over and praying for. Let's look at that difference. Praying over a sick person is not the same as praying for the sick person. No, no, no. There is a reason why James said pray over and not pray for. Praying for the sick person means praying to God on behalf of the sick person. And after that, leaving the results up to God. That's what praying for the sick means. That's not what praying over the sick person means. No. So what does pray over the sick person actually mean? James taught us to pray over him, over the sick person. What does that mean? Well, let's look at this. Let's look at the Greek. Okay. We see at the top the Greek expression, which is translated pray over him. Uh, epi at the top. The Greek word epi is a preposition which is translated over in English. And auton is a word meaning him. Okay, him. Pray over him. Auton is him. Now, epi, according to the scholars, actually means superimposition. Superimposition. And when the object of epi is in the accusative case, it means over, upon, towards. Now, it happens that auton, which is the object of the preposition epi, auton is indeed in the accusative case. Therefore, according to Greek grammar, epi should be translated over. So that is the correct translation. Pray over him. Not pray for him. Pray over him. Pray for him means praying to God on behalf of him. But this is praying over him. It carries a different meaning. Therefore, epi should rightly be translated over and not for. Again, in many non-English translations of the Bible, it just says pray for. It just says pray for. And that's very sad because then we misunderstand exactly what James taught. Praying over the sick is therefore identical to what Jesus taught, which was speaking over the infirm with authority and laying hands over them with power. I repeat, praying over the sick is identical to what Jesus taught. Now, we have seen that ministry to the infirm, as Jesus taught his disciples in the Gospels, was very similar to how the early disciples healed the sick in the book of Acts. In past sessions, we have studied healing in the Gospels, we have studied healing in the book of Acts, and we see that it is very similar. In the book of Acts, the early disciples continued to use supernatural authority and power to heal the sick. But healing in the Gospels and Acts is very different from what it is today. Today, healing is so different. Today, healing emphasizes healing prayer to God on behalf of the sick and then leaving the results up to God. You see my point here? In the Bible, in the New Testament, in particular in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, we see how the healing is done. It is done through supernatural authority and power. Yes. In the Gospels, in the book of Acts, the early disciples were actually performing miraculous healings and casting out demons through the use of supernatural authority and power. But today, it is so different. Today, all we hear about is healing prayer to God on behalf of the sick. Oh, we just pray to God for for my sick father, my sick brother, for brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. And after that, we leave the results up to our merciful God. That is what is taught in the church today, which is so different from what we see in the Gospels in the book of Acts. Is there a reason for that? Is there a good reason why healing 
in the book of Acts and in the Gospels is so different from what it is today? Is there a good reason for that? The answer is no. Today, we are still in the dispensation of the book of Acts. Some people say we are in Acts chapter 29. We are still in Acts. Therefore, the way we should be ministering to, to the sick today during Acts 29 should be the same as the way the disciples ministered to the sick in Acts chapter 1 through 28. And that in itself, and that also is based on what we see in the Gospels as far as healing the sick. In the book of Acts, the disciples simply continued to use the authority and power which Jesus gave them and taught them to use in the Gospels. In the Acts, they simply continued to do the same thing, basically. But today, it's so different. Today in Acts chapter 29, it is so different. Is there a reason for this? Absolutely no. There is no reason why healing the sick today is so different from what we see in the book of Acts, which is based on what we see in the Gospels. There's no reason for that. So, apart from the weak argument of cessationism, there is no reason in Scripture given for the difference between healing in the Gospels in the book of Acts and healing today. There is no reason in Scripture apart from a very weak argument of cessationism, which I don't think any of you believe. Therefore, what James taught about healing should be based exactly on what Jesus taught. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. And what did Jesus teach? He taught the use of supernatural authority and power. Therefore, when Jesus says pray over, he is teaching the use of authority over diseases and demons. He is teaching the use of Power, you lay hands over the sick to transfer healing power. James is teaching authority and power for ministering healing to sick believers, exactly as Jesus did. Now, let's go back to James. James chapter 5, verse 15a. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. <clears throat> now, in that verse above, we see no doubt that the Lord will raise up the sick. Let me just repeat it. The prayer of faith will save the sick. The Lord will raise him up. There's no doubt in that verse. Therefore, what kind of faith is James teaching in that verse? What kind of faith? Well, he is teaching mountain moving faith or faith of God, faith without a doubt. To me, when he says prayer of faith, he's talking about mountain moving faith, faith of God, which we have studied over and over and over again in past sessions. But the sick believer must believe, which is not the case for sick unbelievers. If the sick believer wants to be healed, he must believe. And this is not a condition for sick unbelievers to be, to be healed. Excuse me. <clears throat> James 1, verse 6. But when you ask, for example, ask for healing, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Mark eleven twenty four. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, for example, like healing, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So if you are a sick believer and you want to be healed, you must first believe. Again, uh, unbelievers, if they want to be healed, they don't need to believe first. This is a condition for sick believers. Now here is a very important condition for the sick believer to be healed. This, to me, the most important condition if a believer who is sick wants to be healed. James 5.15b, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. That 
is the condition for a sick believer to be healed. His sins must be forgiven. The condition is that as believers who are accountable to God, believers are accountable to God, therefore the condition is that our sins must first be forgiven. That makes sense. As believers, we are accountable to God. And if we want God to heal us, our sins must first be forgiven. Now, again, I repeat, this condition does not hold for unbelievers to be healed. The condition of having your sins forgiven does not hold for unbelievers who want to be healed. This holds only for believers. For unbelievers, first they are healed, then they believe in Jesus. First they are healed, then they confess their sins and believe in Jesus. Okay, it's the very opposite. But now we're talking about healing for believers. Believers are accountable to God. If you want God to heal you, your sins must first be forgiven. So how can our sins be forgiven? How? Well, we all know that if we confess our sins to God, he is just and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, 1 John 1, 9. But here in James 5, if a believer wants to be healed, it's a bit different. It's a bit different. 16a, therefore, meaning if you want your sins to be forgiven, therefore confess your trespasses to one another. This is how a believer who wants to be healed can have his sins forgiven. You confess your trespasses not only to God, but to one another within the body of Christ. Confessing our trespasses to one another can result in reconciliation with one another. This is very important in the sight of the Lord. He wants reconciliation within his body. Our Father in heaven wants us, his children, to love one another and to live in true unity. We are all his children. If you are a parent and you have three, four, five children, and they're always fighting, accusing one another before you, fighting. How do you feel? You feel terrible. How much more our Father in heaven wants us, his people, to love one another, to live in true unity. Thus, the condition for a believer to be healed is we must forgive one another from the heart. Typically, almost always, there is someone who has hurt you. Maybe another believer in your church. He said something, she did something that hurt you, and now you bear a grudge against that person. You don't like to see that person. You don't like to talk to that person. Well, if you want to be healed of your infirmity, you must forgive that person from your heart. That's a condition. That is the condition for believers to be healed. We must forgive one another. Look at Matthew 5, verse 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. This is what we should do if someone has something against us. We should go to them. We should be reconciled to them. We should say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did that. I didn't do it purposely. I'm sorry for my ignorance. Please forgive me. That's what we should do if someone has something against us. We are reconciled with them. We make peace with them. We confess our trespasses to them. Before they can be healed, believers must, conf must first confess their sins to one another for the sake of reconciliation within the church. We need to go to one another and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But what if you hold something against someone else, someone who wronged you, and you are sick and you want to be healed from your infirmity? 
Well, Mark 11, 25 says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, forgive her, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins, and then you can be healed through the prayer of faith. So if you are the one who is sick and you want to be healed, wow, if you hold anything against anyone, especially in the church, you need to forgive him to forgive her. In that way, your Father in heaven will give, forgive you your sins, and then you can be healed. When we confess our trespasses to one another and are reconciled to one another by forgiving one another, then God will forgive us. And then we can be healed through the prayer of faith, meaning mountain-moving faith, faith of God. Let me share with you a testimony. I taught this message in a church in Brazil on the Sunday morning several years ago. And after teaching this, then I said, now we want to minister to sick believers here in accordance with what we just learned from James chapter 5. And so the first thing we need to do is we need to confess our sins to one another. And I announced to them, now I am going to stop preaching for a few minutes. I'm going to give you time. I want you to get up from your seat and approach someone else in the congregation against whom you have something or who has something against you. And I want you to confess your sin. I want you to forgive one another. I want you to embrace one another. I want you to be reconciled to one another. I want you to make peace between the two of you. And so I saw people get up from their seats and they approached other people in the congregation. They spoke with one another, and then I saw them hug one another. In particular, I saw the pastor's wife get up from her seat. She was seated in front of me at my left. She got up, and then she walked down the aisle. She walked to the back, and there she met a sister, the sister that you see standing next to me. That sister had cancer of her uterus, cancer of her womb. It was very, very serious. She had constant pain. She could not even sit down because of the pain. She was there that Sunday morning. The pastor's wife approached this sister and said to her, Sister, please forgive me. And that sister responded, Yes, dear sister. Yes, pastor's wife. I forgive you. All right. She obeyed what, Jesus, what James taught. Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. And so after that, the pastor's wife and another sister who happened to be standing there laid hands on the womb of this sister. And they rebuked the pain. They exercised authority and they laid hands on her, releasing the Lord's healing power on the woman's womb. The pain instantly disappeared. And then this woman went home. Now, typically at night, she cannot sleep because of the pain. That night, she slept soundly. The next morning, she woke up. She felt fine. She could no longer find the tumor in her womb. The Lord had healed her according to his word. She had obeyed the Lord's word. She had forgiven the pastor's wife. And she was miraculously healed. The next day, she came and gave her testimony. Let's continue with James chapter 5, James 5, verse 16b. And pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, I thought this was a bit strange. Uh, why is it pray for here? But earlier in verse 14, it is pray over. See what I mean? Earlier, it's pray over. I spent a lot of time on that. But now he's going back to pray for. Why? Well, let's take a look. Pray for one another is the above translation of the Greek text. Uh, that's really hard to pronounce, but it's Eusethe uh, Hupe Alelon. Eusethe Hupe Alelon. That's a Greek text. Pray for one another. Let's, let's look at this. Okay. The first word, 
you <laughs> that means pray okay that means pray that greek word there means pray it's been a while since i studied greek okay so, okay let's look at this expression okay that's pray and then hooper is the preposition and then alelon means one another okay so we have the first word pray the last word one another and in the middle is the preposition hooper okay and according to the niv it's translated for okay but listen to this the object of the preposition hooper is alelon okay the object is alelon one another okay now and that word alelon is in the genitive case genitive case okay this is greek grammar you don't really have to know this but let me explain to you why i think the way i do alelon is in the genitive case okay once again we have this expression up there now according to bible lexicons the greek word hooper means over when the object of hooper is in the genitive case that's what i found and it happens that the object of hooper which is alelon is in the genitive case therefore a valid translation of james 5 16b is also pray over one another not pray for one another but pray over one another exactly as it is translated in james 5 verse 14 earlier then james says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective elijah was a human being even as we are he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops so here james encourages us to pray over the sick just like elijah earnestly prayed that it would not rain okay just like elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain that's how we are to pray over the sick all right now exactly how did elijah pray that it would not rain exactly how well Let's have a look at the incident as recorded in 1 Kings. Then we will see exactly how Elijah prayed that it would not rain. And James is telling us the way Elijah prayed that it would not rain. That's how you pray over the sick. Let's take a look. 1 Kings 17 verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Oh, notice Elijah didn't pray. He did not pray, but he said, There will be neither dew nor rain except at my word. Not except at my prayer, but except at my word. Now, the Hebrew for word here is dabar which occurs 13 times in the Old Testament in connection with some word, some thing, or some action which is commanded. Oh. <laughs> According to Strong's, Dabar, or word, can also be translated commandment. Hmm. So Elijah actually did not pray. But he commanded. His word was a command. The Holman Christian Standard Bible renders that verse in the following way. Now, Elijah the Tishbite from the Gilead settlers said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, I stand before him, and there will be no dew or rain during these years except by my command. Therefore, when Elijah, quote unquote, prayed, he actually exercised authority by issuing a command to the sky, to the weather. And that is exactly how we should pray over the sick. 
We issue commands to the sick person. We issue commands to the demons. We lay hands over the sick person. Now, how did Elijah pray for the rain to fall again after three and a half years? Well, let's take a look. 1 Kings 18, verse 42. Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel. He bent down to the ground and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And the servant went up and looked. There's nothing there, the servant said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back, go back, go back. Go back, go back, go back, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, Oh, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. Elijah persevered. He issued eight commands, commands, eight times to his servant before the rain actually fell. And that is how James teaches us to pray over sick believers for them to be healed by issuing commands with authority and perseverance. There is the servant of Elijah looking at the sea and he sees that cloud as the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. And then the rain comes and Elijah has to run. Praise God. Now back to James 5. When the sick are prayed over with authority in the laying on of hands as Jesus did and taught his disciples, the results are often immediate and miraculous. But when the sick are prayed for in the traditional manner, the immediate results are often non-existent. I believe you've all experienced this. James 5 is not instructing us in the operation of a special gift of healing, which not every believer has. No, he is not teaching the gift of healing. No, instead, James is explaining how any scripturally qualified elder can minister healing to infirm believers through the exercise of authority and power over their infirmities with mountain-moving faith and perseverance. So for those of you who have been with us since session one, this is nothing new, nothing new at all. What James is teaching is precisely what James, what Jesus taught in the Gospels. The major difference is that sick believers who want to be healed must confess their sins to one another. They must forgive one another because unforgiveness is a poison. It's, a, it's toxic. It can keep you from being healed. Unforgiveness is a poison. If you want to be healed, you must forgive. That is a condition. If you do not forgive, you probably will not be healed. Let me share with you these three directions that we see in Mark 11, verses 23, 24, and 25. Three directions, and this will be familiar to you if you have been with us since session one. Faith of God for commanding diseases and demons. Diseases and demons are under our authority. So when we issue commands with faith of God, the direction is down, down. We are issuing commands to things under our authority. So the direction of faith of God is down. Mark eleven twenty three. If anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea. If anyone says to this mountain, to this disease, to this demon, go, and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. That is faith of God. That's how you heal the sick and cast out demons. And the direction is down over infirmities and demons which are under our authority. Now, verse 24, the very next verse, look what the Lord tells us. He teaches us about faith in God, which is for our relationship with God above. Therefore, I tell you, Whatever you ask for in prayer, 
When you ask for it in prayer to God above, believe you have received it and it will be yours. What is the direction of faith in God? It is up. God is over us. He is over us in authority. He is over us. Therefore, when we pray to God with faith in God, the direction is up. Faith in God is up. And when we pray, we believe that we have received it. We do not doubt whatever we ask for in prayer. Now, and I believe this is for obedient disciples. Obedient disciples. He's talking to his disciples here. Not just anyone, but to his disciples. Whatever you ask me for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. So this verse is especially for obedient disciples. Now, the third direction, what I call the horizontal direction. This is for our horizontal relationship with other people. We need to forgive them. We need to forgive them. God wants us to be reconciled to other people, to live in peace with them. We need to forgive them. Mark 11, the third verse of the series, verse 25, And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, forgive her, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins, and then you can be healed through the prayer of faith. So one condition for having mountain-moving faith and answers to prayer is forgiving others. If you want mountain-moving faith, which was taught in verse 23, just two slides earlier, verse 23 taught about mountain-moving faith. Well, one condition for having that mountain-moving faith and answers to prayer, that's in verse 24, the condition is forgiving others from your heart. It is so important not to have in your heart a grudge, unforgiveness, hate, bitterness toward anyone else, be it your wife, your children, your mother-in-law, your husband, your pastor, your elder, your neighbor. You must forgive them from your heart. That is the condition for having mountain-moving faith. That is the condition for having answers to prayer. Forgive others from your heart. Now, just very quickly, let me just say something about spirits which cause infirmities. Many infirmities are purely physical in nature and do not have any demonic cause. Many, for example, if I catch a cold because someone sneezed in my face, I believe that is purely physical in nature. I don't think there's any demon involved. In such a case, we simply heal the physical infirmity without driving out any demon. For example, if you're out in the garden uh, working and you get up suddenly and you strain your back. Well, I don't think necessarily a demon did that. You just got up too quickly and you strained your back. It's purely physical. So in that case... We simply heal the physical infirmity with authority and power. We don't have to drive out any demon. So many infirmities, at least I should say some infirmities, are purely physical in nature and without any demonic cause. Okay. However, according to scripture, some infirmities can be caused by the action of demon spirits. Yes. Luke 11.14, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. So, demons can cause an, 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 Ill, in, an inability to speak. This particular demon rendered this man mute, unable to speak. And after Jesus drove it out, the demon left, and then he started speaking. So, this demon caused muteness. How do you minister? You drive the demon out. This man did not need physical healing, but rather deliverance from the mute demon. After Jesus drove the demon out, the man was immediately healed and able to speak. So this particular infirmity was purely demonic in nature. Matthew 12, verse 22, Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Ah, so this man had a demon that caused him to be blind and mute. And Jesus healed him, 
so that he could both talk and see. Jesus drove out this demon, and after the demon left, the man could both talk and see. Demons can cause blindness. Yes. So please take this into account when you're ministering to people. Now, let me say something about the English expression demon possessed that we saw in that earlier verse. This expression demon possessed is actually not found in the original Greek. It is actually, in my view, a very poor translation of what the Greek says. Therefore, the question of demon possession for a believer is not relevant. Uh, you've heard this debate. What, can a born-again believer de be demon-possessed? Okay. And of course, my answer is, of course not. He has been purchased by the blood of Jesus. Now, Jesus possesses him. A believer cannot be demon-possessed. Okay. But actually, this expression, demon possession, is not found in the Bible. So the question is actually not relevant. The Greek terms are better translated to have a demon or to be demonized. Demonetzomai. This should be translated to have a demon or to be demonized. And can believers be demonized? Yes, absolutely. Believers can be demonized if, for example, they commit sin. If you have a believer, let's say a young man who was born again, but one day he decides to go to the internet and look at pornography on the internet, that born again believer can get a demon, can become demonized after looking at the pornography, and he will need deliverance, okay? So believers can be demonized. They can have a demon, but they are not demon-possessed, all right? This, the man, simply had a demon or demons, which made him blind and mute, that man in the earlier verse, okay? So again, believers cannot be demon-possessed, of course not. But they can have a demon, they can be demonized, if they choose to sin against God. All right. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Make disciples, not just believers, disciples of all nations. That's where the church has failed. We're not making disciples. We're just making believers. And some of them are very, very immature. Verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything, 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 everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And generally, we have failed to teach believers everything Jesus commanded. For one thing, we don't teach them how to heal the sick and cast out demons in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God. And those things are very important for the Great Commission to be fulfilled. We have not obeyed the Lord's command to obey so many things that Jesus commanded. And in this particular case, we have not taught believers how to obey, fulfill the Great Commission by healing the sick, casting out demons, and preaching the gospel. And so I would say we have for the most part failed, and that's why it has taken 2,000 years, and we have still not yet completed the Great Commission. Among other things, Jesus commanded his disciples to heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. And this is what we must be commanding, what we must be teaching God's people today. We must teach disciples to obey Luke 10, verse 9, for the sake of of the Great Commission, just as the early disciples did. Just as the early disciples obeyed Luke 10, verse 9, today, in the year 2021, we must teach disciples to obey Luke 10, verse 9. And this is for the sake of fulfilling the Great Commission during these very last days. Now, I have an announcement. On three nights, three days, September 7, 8, and 9, we will be having a miracle healing rally, three evangelistic healing Zoom events. It will start at 7 a.m. in the state of Texas. If you live in Malaysia, 8 p.m. This is for those who do not know Jesus. 
If you know people who don't yet know Jesus and they need physical healing, invite them to come. On these three evenings, I will proclaim the kingdom of God. I will not be teaching, no. I will be simply preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And after that, we will heal the sick as evidence that Jesus is the Son of God, the only way to the Father. And that's why I hope that you will be with me. I, because I want you to join me in ministering healing to these sick pre-believers who come. If possible, please invite them to your home. Maybe a very small group of two or three people. Invite them to your home where you go to their home. And you get on the Zoom. And you have them listen to the gospel. And afterwards, I will lead you to lay hands on them. To heal them in Jesus' name as evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. So, please spread the news. Spread the news with those who do not know Jesus and who need healing. If you need the Zoom link, email me, Elijah003 at gmail.com. Email me, Elijah003. Invite those who never heard to hear the gospel and to be healed in Jesus' name. Finally, a very important announcement. For those of you who have completed this training, I invite you to come to a class for radical disciples during the last days. And I believe many of you are radical disciples. You want to obey the Lord. This will consist of six months of one hour teachings every Saturday. One hour every Saturday. It will begin at 9 a.m. Houston time or 10 p.m. Malaysia time. And after each teaching, there will be a time of ministry to the sick. It begins Saturday, September 18. Next month, Saturday, September 18, will be the first session of six months. Uh, no registration, no fee is required. Freely I have received, freely I give. I just want you to come and be trained. Trained as a radical disciples. Disciples who will please the Lord through radical obedience to his commands. The subjects I will cover will include the following. How your eternal reward is determined. Your eternal reward is far more than just eternal life. It's far more than just salvation. But if you are faithful to the Lord, if you obey his commands and bear much good fruit for him, you will be given authority to reign with Christ in his kingdom. Not all believers will be given this authority, but only those who have been obedient and fruitful will be given this authority to reign with Christ in his kingdom. Come, learn how to maximize your eternal reward. Why should we just get to heaven by the skin of our teeth, just barely saved? Don't you want to get to heaven and hear the Lord say to you, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Take charge of ten cities. I will teach about radical grace for the very last days. I will not teach about the grace that you usually hear on Sunday mornings, that, you know, grace, saved by grace through faith, not by works. I will not be teaching that. You already know that. But I'm going to teach you radical grace, how to excel in the various forms of grace in order that you may maximize your eternal reward in the age to come. Radical grace. I will be teaching about the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. Have you ever wondered why the why so many believers are so weak? So weak. Why is the church like this? How come there are so few mature believers? How come there are so few believers like the early disciples? Well, you come and I'll tell you why the church is in its relatively poor state the way it is today. Why has the church not fulfilled the Great Commission in 2,000 years? Why in some countries are believers oppressed and afraid to share the gospel? Why is the situation like that around the world? Well, you come to this teaching and I'll tell you why. Why the world is the way it is. Why the church has failed to fulfill the Great Commission. Why the church is so different from the early church in the book of Acts. Why? I'll tell you why. I will teach about the popular understanding of the anointing and it will be different from what you have heard. It will be different from what you have been hearing with regard to the anointing. And I will teach about the practice of strategic level spiritual warfare, which is somewhat popular in many churches. 
But the popular understanding is not what the Bible teaches. So come, and I will include other topics not typically taught on Sundays. This will be for radical disciples, not ordinary believers, not churchgoers, not church hoppers, but radical disciples. And that is the Zoom link. Now, you can take a picture of that if you would like, or even better, if you don't have your camera ready, just email me, Elijah003 at gmail.com, and I will give you that Zoom link. And I believe the flyer has been distributed here and there, so you may already have the Zoom link. I invite you to join us. Hope to see you on September 18. Now, again, this is the very last session. And so next Monday, uh, I will not be here, but I believe that uh, our Elijah Warriors are very kindly arranged for these nine series to be repeated again. So it's not over. Uh, I will not be with you, but it is not over. This teaching will be continued. Now, I want to minister to a brother named Marshall. Marshall has had tinnitus ringing in his ears, and I want to minister to him. So Marshall, would you please raise your hand? I am going to unmute everyone. Okay, you can unmute yourself, Brother Marshall. Are you there? Marshall has had tinnitus. It tor torments him, and uh, he has tried everything. Uh, nothing has worked yet. Okay, he still has the ringing in his ears, so I would like to take advantage of the opportunity to minister to him. Marshall, are you there? Uh, if you are there, um, unmute yourself and uh, and speak out. Marshall Hill, zero one two. Ah, Marshall. Yeah, Hugh. Marshall. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm yes. Here. Uh, here you yes. are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can hear you, Marshall. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can hear you. Okay. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. Okay. You recall what we just studied from James chapter five that one condition for a believer to be healed is to forgive others. Now, yes. are you a believer? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Now, now you must forgive those who have hurt you in the past. I believe uh, in the heart of every believer, there is some hurt toward someone else who hurt them in the past. <laughs> and so uh, you don't have to explain the details, but later uh, we need to pray and we are going to forgive those people. Are you willing to do that? Yes, yes. Okay. So, first we're going to pray, and uh, we will go to the Lord, and we will say, Lord, please forgive me for uh, my bitterness against those people who hurt me. I, Lord, I now forgive them from my heart in Jesus' name. Okay? And uh, I, I think everyone should do this, because uh, everyone who is listening I'm sure we have something against someone who has hurt us in the past, especially in the church. All right. So everyone, whether you need healing or not, it is good for all of us to be reconciled to those people with whom we cannot get along. So I want everyone to follow me in this prayer. OK. And then after that, then we will minister to Marshall. And then after Marshall is healed, then we will minister to everyone else who needs healing. Uh, simultaneously as we usually do okay all right so uh let me do the following um let me just um, i'm just going to mute everyone again so that uh so that we don't hear everyone repeating the prayer after me because uh that can be rather uh distracting so here um i'm going to mute everyone again okay now okay let's pray Okay, Marshall, here we go. Let's pray. If you want to close your eyes, you can, because now we're praying to God. Let us pray. And uh, Marshall, especially Marshall, yes. uh, if you can, repeat after me. Okay, here we go. Okay. I'll repeat. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And Lord, 
Your condition is that I forgive others. Your condition is that I forgive others. So now, Father, I forgive those who have hurt me in the past. I forgive those who have hurt me in the past. Those who have wronged me, those who have said things to hurt me, Father, I forgive them from my heart. Those who have wronged me, they have said things against me, I forgive them from my heart. You have forgiven me of so much, Father. You have forgiven me, forgiven me so much, Father. Now I forgive them, Father. Now I forgive them. I release them, Father. I release them. From my heart, I release them. I release them from my heart. Forgive me of the bitterness and the hatred I have in my heart toward anyone, Father. Forgive me of the bitterness and the hatred I have to anyone. I confess my sins, Father. I confess my sin, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You enable me to forgive them. You enable me to forgive them. You have forgiven me of so much. You have forgiven me of so much. And so I now forgive them of the relatively little that they have done toward me. So I forgive them of the little that they have done towards me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now, Father, I ask you to heal my hearing. Now, Father, I ask you to heal my hearing. Take away the tinnitus, the ringing in my ears. Take away the tinnitus, the ringing in my ears. So that I can hear your voice more clearly. So that I can hear your voice more clearly. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay. Now, let's open our eyes. And now we are going to speak directly to the tinnitus. Okay. So, uh, Marshall, do you have tinnitus in both ears or just in one ear? Mostly it's in my right ear. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes a little ear. Like okay. That. Put your finger in your right ear. And we do that in order for the healing power to flow directly to where it is needed, to the right ear where most of the tinnitus comes from. So put your finger in the right ear. Now, we are going to exercise authority. We are going to pray over you with authority. Uh, you are putting your finger in your right ear, and that releases the Lord's healing power. All right, and now we are going to exercise authority over it. We're going to pray over you in Jesus' name with authority. Here we go. Now, I would like everyone to join me in this, okay, uh, including you, Marshall. Yes. Now, uh, I hope that you're the only one who is unmuted. <laughs> I hope that everyone else remains muted, okay? Everyone else, stay muted. Otherwise, we'll have too many voices, okay? So, uh Everyone else, you stay muted, but just Marshall, Marshall, okay? You repeat these commands after me. Here we go. Eyes open. Now, we are going to rebuke this tormenting infirmity, and we are going to command it to go and to stop, all right? And we're going to do so with no doubt. Marshall, do you believe that Jesus is going to heal you right now? Yes, amen. Okay, good. Let's do it right now. Here we go. Finger in the right ear. Now, repeat this after me. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I rebuke this tinnitus. I rebuke this tinnitus. Stop in Jesus' name. Stop in Jesus' name. Any spirit of infirmity, leave in Jesus' name. Any spirit of infirmity, leave in Jesus' name. Go now. Go. Now, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, ear be healed, ear be healed, auditory nerve be healed in Jesus' name, auditory nerves be healed in Jesus' name, stop ringing now, stop ringing now. Okay, okay, Marshall, remove your finger. Is there any change? No. No change. All right. No change. Let's do it again. Here we go. 
Repeat after me. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Tinnitus, go. Tinnitus, go. Go now. Go now. Ear, be healed and restored in Jesus' name. Ear, be healed and restored in Jesus' name. Every unclean spirit, leave, leave, leave. Go now. Every unclean spirit, leave. Go, go, go now. Go. Tinnitus, stop now. Tinnitus, stop now. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Tinnitus, stop now. Be quiet Tinnitus, in Jesus' name. Now. Be quiet. Be quiet in Jesus' name. Okay. How is it now? Is there any change yet? No. It's still, I can hear ringing, but the ringing... Something something happened this morning. Actually, when I woke up, the ringing became soft. Oh. Morning okay. itself, it was soft. So I, I actually, I, I thought I was healed this morning when I woke up. And I, <laughs> okay. I, I tried, I was, I was struggling to listen. And then I heard, oh, it is still ringing. But okay. then it's very soft. So, so even before uh, the prayer session start, it, it was already soft this morning. Okay, praise the Lord. Okay. But it's very soft. Okay, let's do it one more time. Okay, praise the Lord. That's good news, actually. That's good news. Because yeah. I have, yeah, I was already ministering to you <laughs> even before today. All right, one more time. Amen. Finger in the ear, one more time. In Amen. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Stop ringing. Stop ringing. I rebuke this ringing. Stop. Stop, stop, go. I rebuke this ringing. Stop, 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 go. Don't go. come back. Don't come back. Be healed. Be healed. Now. Now. Go. Go. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All ringing, stop in Jesus' name. All ringing, stop in Jesus' name. And do not come back. Do not come back. Do not come back. The Go. Lord heals you, Marshall. All right. How is it? Any change? Actually, it changed a lot since this morning and until now. It's, it's very soft. and. Okay. All right. I mean, it, 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 when it's soft, I'm, I'm like healed. I, it, it doesn't bother me at all. If, like now, it doesn't bother me. But when I... Put my finger here. I can hear soft, soft. Okay. So, so then it's ringing, but then it's very soft and it doesn't bother me. Okay, wonderful. Here, I'll tell you what. You continue this on your own, okay? You know how to yeah. do it now, correct? Yeah, I do know. it the same way and do it with authority and no doubt. Do it with okay. holy anger because this thing has tormented you for many years, right? You hate it, do you not? So, it, it months. Eight, eight months. Nine months. So you know how to treat it. Holy anger. Get rid of it. It's an enemy. Okay. All right. I know. I know. Okay. Wonderful, Marshall. Okay. Now, uh, let's minister to everyone who needs healing. Okay. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, you're, you're welcome, Marshall. Okay. Now, before I go, let me just minister to everyone who needs healing. Now, uh, all of you have already forgiven, right? You have forgiven those who have hurt you in the past. You all repeated that prayer after me. You have forgiven them. Now, as believers, I can say you are eligible to be healed because you have satisfied the condition. You have been reconciled to others. So now, let's minister. Lay hands on yourself wherever you have the problem or the pain. Put your hand there. And now, everyone together, let us issue commands. Let's exercise authority. In Jesus' name, okay? So you don't have to close your eyes. Your eyes can be open, okay? So just give me a second here. I just want to check everything before we go on. Um, okay, so just stay muted. Stay muted. Here we go. Repeat after me. In the name of Jesus, every infirmity go now. In Jesus' name, I rebuke all pain. Pain, leave every spirit of infirmity. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. 
the Son of the Living God, all diseases go, all pain go, cancers go, dissipate, vanish in Jesus' name, tumors go in Jesus' name, high blood pressure go down in Jesus' name, blood sugar go down in Jesus' name, pain go, spirit of infirmity go, spirit of oppression, depression go in the name of Christ, the Son of the living God, back pain go knee pain go kidney disease go kidneys be restored heart conditions be totally healed heart beat normally blood flow normally valves open and close normally in jesus name lung disease go breathe normally lungs open up in jesus name gastrointestinal system diseases go stomach be healed in jesus name kidneys healed gallbladder healed in jesus name the lord heals you the lord heals you in the name of jesus every spirit of infirmity go do not come back in jesus name now some of you have been healed i would like to hear your testimonies so you can unmute yourselves and testify who has been healed who has been healed Unmute yourself and give the glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes. What's your name, brother? Well, my name is Michael Thornton. I am healed. Oh, hello, Michael. Yes. Hello. What are you healed from, Michael? Uh, my knee pain and then, of course, my chest, my heart. So. Your your heart. You had a problem with your heart, and now well, you feel it. I was always getting chest. It seemed like the uh, pressure was building up, and then of course my knee. Yeah. So well, praise the Lord. So you feel different now, huh? Yes. Yes. Can you uh, can you start jumping up and down? Okay, sure. Let me see you exert yourself a bit. Let me see. Okay. Mm, wow. Okay, how does that feel? Feel okay? It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Praise yes. the Lord. Okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have another testimony? One more from someone um, whom the Lord has touched. Amen. 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 Yeah. That's why my right ear. Yeah. My right ear ringing gone. Disappeared. Oh. My right ear. No more ringing. Oh, praise the gone. Lord. Edmund, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the ringing is gone. <laughs> yeah, right here. I'm gone. Praise the Lord. While we were ministering to Marshall, the Lord healed Edmund. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes, that's the nature of authority. It's not affected yeah. by distance or number. Uh, yeah. well, thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Can we have one more testimony? Yeah, yes. yeah. Me. Yes. Yes. Uh, who is Who is that? Something, something. Pang. Oh, can, can we spotlight him, please? Pang. Ah, there we go. Yes, okay. what happened, brother? Yeah, I, I have this, uh, this uh, cyst uh, uh, in my elbow. A, on my arm. a cyst, right? Okay. Oh. Uh, it's a numb. Oh. Okay, now no, now no, no more. No more. Wow. Praise and then the Lord. you see this uh, uh, doctor, uh, brother, doctor, uh, uh, Henny Ng and uh, brother Robert Chong minister to me. Subsequently, I continue doing myself and then now it's almost gone. Oh, you had a I cyst. Totally gone. It's totally gone. Oh, the, oh, no more cyst. Wow. Praise the yeah. Lord. Praise yeah. the Lord. No Praise no the Lord. No Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you brother. I have the old photo. Yes, okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. You can send the old photo. Send the old photo yeah, so yeah. everyone can see it later. Yeah, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. okay, praise the Lord. Uh, so, um, Brother Brother Chi, Brother Yan Long, I'm going to hand the mic back to you. And uh, please take over and continue with the breakout rooms. Continue ministering. Okay, all right. Uh, let me thank see. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. 
the chair of William Lau. Oh. A special round of applause to Thank you, Pastor Thank you, Pastor. 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 Thank you, Pastor.